This is Flight and Fight, a 3D plane fighting game that I made using C++ and OpenGL. I spent a couple months working on it, and I figured I could make this video to share, summarize, and document some of the more interesting aspects of the project. Anyway, enjoy! So, for Flight and Fight, there are two game modes, Fight Mode and Casual Mode. The basic idea behind the game loop for Fight Mode is that you fly a plane around and you shoot at various enemies, such as hot air balloons, blimps, and enemy planes. And enemy planes can target and shoot back at you. You have to survive for as long as possible before you run out of health or crash into the terrain, and, acu and you have to accumulate the highest score you can. There's also Casual Mode, in which you can fly around and explore the world without the stress of enemies attacking you and attempting to blow you up. Alright, one interesting thing about this game is that the terrain you see in the background is entirely procedurally generated and can extend forever, albeit issues arrive due to floating point imprecision the farther you go from the origin. One of the motivations I had for making this project was to show off the terrain generation as you flew your plane around the world, as for a while I'd also been investigating and learning how to make a decent looking 3D world generator, and I figured this project would be a pretty good one to put that technology to use. For how the terrain generation works, I use Perlin noise to generate the world, and I add some transformations to the noise, such as making regions where the noise value was below negative 0.1, but below 0 to have their height values interpolated between 0.003 to 0.03 to significantly flatten it out and create flat beaches, because, well, beaches should be somewhat close to 0 and, well, Y0, which is what I set to be sea level for this. And another thing that I did was that I generated the vertices for the chunks that were close to the player and then generated new chunks on the fly when needed so that it could, well, continuously generate more terrain. And, well, anyway, this stuff is pretty well documented and when it comes to procedural generation, you can find a lot of resources online to help if you want to learn more. Another thing of note are the various optimizations that had to be made in order to render this much terrain on the screen. Firstly, there's frustum culling to determine which chunks are outside of the camera's view frustum so that we don't have to waste draw calls on them. Additionally, there's vertex compression where we only set the height of the vertex over and calculate the XZ position based on the index of the vertex. And there's some compression of the normal vector as we only need two angles to determine the normal. Additionally, the program also generates several sets of chunks of varying levels of detail. The high detail chunks are close to the camera and the low detail chunks are drawn farther away from the camera. I'm not going to go into further detail here because the terrain just serves as a pretty background for most of the time. And I got pretty much all of these optimizations from this video by Versidium. Uh, is that how you say his name? I don't know. Uh, anyway, it helped me a lot and if you're interested, you should definitely go check it out. The player controls are quite simple. You have W and S to pitch down and up, and A and D to rotate to yaw. I didn't bother implementing roll, as I'm not sure how I could have implemented it so that the controls felt good, and I also imagined that if I had the camera roll, that would have induced motion sickness in some people. Therefore, I just opted for simplified controls and work nicely. The plane does bank if you rotate using the A and D keys. You can also accelerate the plane using the left shift key or scrolling up using the scroll wheel and decelerate with left control and scrolling down. Of course, in fight mode, we need to spawn in enemies to, well, fight. The enemy spawning is fairly simple. I have some timers that keep track of how much time has passed, and once a sufficient amount of time has gone by and there aren't too many enemies, and if random chance allows it, the game will spawn, well, a new enemy. Uh, the planes are somewhat special in that many of them can be spawned at once if enough time has passed in the game. More planes spawn the more time has passed, and this creates a difficulty curve. There are multiple types of enemies, balloons, blimps, planes, and UFOs. The balloons and blimps are quite simple. The balloons just float up and down while the blimps just travel in a straight line. There isn't much to say about them. The enemy planes, in my opinion, are more interesting. They have to actually target and make a decent effort at destroying the player plane. At first, I tried to make the plane rotate in the direction of the result in it being able to face the player plane the quickest, but this ended up being rather difficult to pull off and rather buggy. But then I realized there was actually a way to measure how much the player the enemy plane was targeting the player plane, the dot product. I could simply take the normalized vector of the difference between the enemy plane position and the player plane position and calculate the dot product between the direction the enemy plane is traveling in. The closer the dot product is to 1, the better the enemy plane is targeting the player, and if the dot product is close to negative 1, the enemy plane is facing away from the player. 
Therefore, this just becomes a situation where I have to maximize the dot product of the normalized position difference vector and the enemy plane direction if I want to target the player plane. If I want the enemy plane to turn away, I can simply change the goal to be minimizing the dot product. The way I attempted to minimize slash maximize the dot product was to simply change the orientation of the plane a small amount and check the dot product of that temporary transform and rotate the enemy in the opposite direction and then check the dot products and choose whichever one is bigger or smaller. Alright, so this is going to be a quick walkthrough of the code for updating the enemy plane, if you are interested. Anyway, um, I will just be covering the enemy update plane function. So, of course, we pass in the delta time, the player object, and, well, the bullet array for us to, well, shoot in, and also... This is just for us to calculate the height of the terrain so that way we can determine if the enemy plane is crashing in the terrain or if the enemy plane needs to, you know, avoid the terrain. So, of course, this is just updating the, calculating the velocity of the plane and, well, if we're trying to turn away from the player, I just had it so that the player, well, the enemy plane goes even faster and this is just standard update stuff. We have some timers as well for, uh, I believe rotation timer determines how long it, we have until we can turn around so that way the, well, enemy plane actually pursues the player for some amount of time I believe. And we also have a timer to determine how long it is until the enemy plane can shoot again. And this is where we calculate the difference vector and then also the direction that the enemy plane is facing in. And also we have the difference in direction they're facing the XZ plane. This is for determining the rotation about the Y axis, which I'll go into later. And of course, we also calculate the dot product. And this is for, this is the code for shooting at it. The plane will only shoot at the player if it's close enough, or if the, and also if the dot product exceeds a certain amount, so that way it knows that it stands a decent chance of hitting the player. And also, this is where we attempt to change the direction and of the plane. For instance, if we're too close to the player, then we have to turn around. Also, we have to turn around if uh, we are, you know, close enough to the player and, well, also targeting the player pretty decently with the, you know, checking if the dot product is greater than... 0.98 and yeah I'm not gonna go into full detail here anyway this is the code for determining how well which direction we should rotate in so here we first attempt to rotate in the positive direction and then calculate the dot product and then we reset it back to the original position and then we attempt to rotate in the negative direction and then we again calculate the dot product and then we compare them. Whichever one we attempt to, well, whichever one's greater, we will rotate in because that's a direction in which we should, in theory, be able to better target the player. And yeah, same story for rotation about the x axis, except there's some slight other things, such as if we are too close to the terrain, then the enemy plane will actually prioritize flying up as it obviously you don't want to crash into a mountain and also oh if we are too close to the player then it will attempt to rotate away from the player instead uh, and yeah so this is for or the checking of the dot product and yeah that's pretty much it it's kind of simple I I mean, uh, I'm not sure how quality this code is. It's a little bit... I probably could do with more comments now that I think about it. So this segment of the video is just going to be me rambling about random other interesting things that I investigated but was too lazy to actually organize in the rest of the video. This is actually the first project that I've ever made where I've had to import 3D models, well, OBJ files in this case, into the game and have them rendered, so I had to learn Blender. I have tried a few times to learn in the past, but unfortunately got scared and gave up and put it off. However, over the summer I was finally able to work up the motivation and watch the Blender Guru's tutorials on how to model the 
and use Blender, which were extremely helpful. I'm grateful for him making these tutorials. Anyway, after getting over the learning curve, I actually really like Blender and was able to make some uh, simple models with it, and I hope to be able to have more opportunities in the future to practice and use Blender for more games. Another interesting part of this game was that as I was increasing the number of 3D models, textures, and shaders, it was getting annoying to have to write code to import everything in the game manually, so I decided to create a way to input the paths and metadata related to the game assets so that the game could import them. So, hence, I created the import files, or imp files. The basic idea behind this is that it, this file format is stores uh, entries that are just hash maps that can be used to store data in the form of strings. Infos were pretty helpful for managing assets as the project grew, and I believe they have potential application beyond just storing game asset metadata. For instance, I have one info that stores the save settings for the game. I might reuse this code for future projects. One of the interesting graphical things I had to implement was an explosion. It took a bit of effort, but I was able to get an effect that I liked in the end. The basic idea behind it is that the program renders a bunch of instance quads that have their position, rotation, and size controlled by a shader. Also, the quads are billboarded so that they are always face the camera. I learned how to do this with GLCell using a tutorial from OpenGLTutorial.org. If you're interested, I'll link to the article on billboarding down below. So, this is the shader code for the, well explosion uh, and well particles um, this is a fragment shader and this is the vertex here the fragment shader isn't particularly interesting it does make the explosion darker over time to give the impression of smoke but that's about all it really does so the vertex shader is slightly more interesting in my opinion so firstly we calculate an ID value for or based off of the instance ID, this will be used for um, our attempt at random number generation, or at least to create some amount of simulated randomness. Uh, I'll discuss that when we get there. Um, this is the stuff from the tutorial on getting the, uh, well, quad to billboard. And yeah, okay, so yeah, this is where the ID comes in. This is our, well, the angle, I believe, is should determine the, well, position this should take from the center of the explosion. And, yeah, I just use some trigonometric functions to hopefully create, uh, di you know, distribute it roughly evenly. And this is to determine how far it would be from the center of the explosion. And, yeah, also the explosion particles rise up over time because, you know, they're turning into smoke, I suppose, and smoke rises. And yeah, that's about it for the shader. It's, again, kind of simple, but overall, create a pretty decent effect. Another interesting graphical problem I had to solve was how to make trees to decorate the terrain. The plain trees were just texture cones put together and aren't particularly interesting. However, the deciduous trees are generated using Linden Meyer systems or L systems, which are very interesting, and I won't go into full detail about them here, but the basic idea is that you have a starting structure that contains instructions for how to grow a plant, tree, or structure, and then is iterated upon to create recursive structures. Anyway, it was interesting to make, and I like how the trees look in the end. Of course, audio is a very important part of the gaming experience and can add quite a bit of character and life to a game. So, to simulate 3D sound, I used a library called OpenAL, or more specifically OpenAL Soft, which is an LGPL license implementation. I also used a single header library called DRWAV to load WAV files. For the user interface, I used a library called Nuclear, which is a single header C library for making GUIs, and it's quite simple and nice to use, and I was able to create what, in my opinion, was a pretty good looking UI, so I'll probably use nuclear in the future for other projects and should I get the chance. Overall, I thought that this was a very fun project to work on and I learned so much over the few months that I worked on this and if you thought this was interesting, consider checking out the source code on GitHub and also downloading the game on itch.io. If you liked the video, then consider leaving a comment with your thoughts and feedback. Maybe also consider liking and subscribing as well. Anyway, that's it. Have a nice day.